morning. morning. Welcome to Central Park Church. The fact that you're here means that you survived tulip time and all of tulip time traffic. And if you're not here, I'm not sure what that means. (laughs) But it's good to be together as the people of God. So we've been going through the story of Jonah for the last number of weeks. And at this point, Jonah is moving from being down inside the fish, and he's actually going to Nineveh to do what God called him to do. And so I thought it was a good reminder for us this morning to think about Genesis 1, verse 27, where it says that God created humanity in his image. So it's, it wasn't just the Israelites that were created in his image, and it wasn't just the Ninevites, but it was both, especially the people that were outside of the fold that God was calling Jonah to. And so that's also true for us, right? Like, and thank God, because we aren't Israelites. We would be the outsiders. And so thanks be to God that he doesn't just call a small group of people, but that he wants to invite all of humanity to be in relationship to him. And so with that on our hearts, please stand in body or spirit as we praise and worship. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet And I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you shadows you win every battle 
nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, oh, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. And nothing can stand against the power of our one last time. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give thanks to you that we can be together as your people, the people of God made in your image, and we can be here together this morning to worship you. We also give you thanks that we are made in your image, which is predominantly of love, that you are a God of love, and that we can trust in you that you will fight our battles for us and that we can fight them on our knees by bringing them to you. Please receive this worship as a blessing and honor to you. It's in your name alone that we pray. Amen. Please remain standing as we continue to sing. of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, Alleluia, Alleluia, thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam, oh praise him, oh praise him, Alleluia, Alleluia. Alleluia. Thou rushing wind that are so strong, ye clouds that sail in heaven along. Oh, praise him. Alleluia. Thou rising morn in praise rejoice, ye lights of evening find a voice. Oh, praise him, oh, praise him, alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Thou flowing water, pure and clear, make music for thy Lord to hear, alleluia, alleluia. So masterful and bright that give us both both warmth and light. Oh, praise him, oh, praise him, alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Let all things their creator bless and worship him in humbleness oh praise him alleluia praise praise the 
Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit, three in one. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. 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 Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise his name, I'm fixed upon it. Name of God's redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer hither by thy help i've come and i hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of god he to rescue me from danger bought me with his precious blood oh to grace how great a debtor daily i'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee prone to wander lord i feel it prone to leave the god i love here's my heart oh take and seal it seal it for thy courts above you may be seated <clears throat> we come together as to as the people of god this morning to worship and to praise him thankful for all the good things that he's done in and through and among us we have many things to celebrate today to to be a part of as the people of god i want to invite you to come back again this afternoon at two o'clock we are having a service uh, along with holland classes for, to commission uh, max as a commission pastor here and so i just invite you to come and be a part of that uh, that time of worship and celebration as well so two o'clock this afternoon i invite you to come and be a part of that um, Memorial Day is coming up, and once again, we're doing a Memorial Day geraniums. If you'd like to give us some geraniums in memory of those who have passed on or those of your family you just simply like to honor, the envelopes are in the back. Uh, next Sunday is going to be the last day to turn those in if you'd like to make a donation for that. Uh, Vacation Bible School is coming up. It is going to be June 20 through 23 in the evenings, and uh, the, the board is out there looking for volunteers in a variety of uh, roles and tasks for VBS this year. I think we've got most of our leader folks in place, but we need all those helpers in a variety of ways as well. And so also we are looking for kids to, uh, to register and be a part of Vacation Bible School. Um, so just as a way of inviting you to uh, invite others, I'm passing around a basket that has uh, little cards in it that are, you can hand off to a neighbor or to a friend, invite them to, uh, to register for Vacation Bible School. So I'll start this one over here. So you pass it back. You can think of someone that you might... Uh, um, might uh, be able to invite uh, to be a part of that, please uh, please do so. Let's get the word out uh, to people that we know that might want to be a part of VBS this, uh, this season. Uh, one of the things that we have, oh, next Sunday is our, uh, our annual spring congregational meeting. Uh, we sent out uh, an agenda by email this week. There's some copies on the, uh, the tables in the entryway uh, with all the nominees on it for elders and deacons. Uh, we've got a few other things to talk about this year, so rather than doing it in the worship service, we're moving it to the gathering place right after the worship service. So next Sunday, plan a little bit uh, longer time of uh, coming together. We'll, we'll break so that you can, can get a cup of coffee and cookies, and we'll sit over in the gathering place, and we'll do our... Um, our selecting of elders and deacons uh, for the new year, and then also we'll have some conversation about finances and ministry and all those kinds of things as well. So I invite you to be part of that next Sunday morning uh, when we come together. 
Um, one of the things that we had, uh, have been working on over the past uh, year has been to kind of write down who it is that we are, kind of describe ourselves as a congregation, uh, put those things in writing in a way that enables us to live more fully into that. Uh, the more we to know about, um, the more we know about who God has created us to be, the better able we are to, to live that out in our community. And so the mission that God has given to us is, is that of crossing boundaries in Jesus' love um, to meet needs, build relationships, and grow disciples. To cross boundaries in Jesus' love, to meet needs, build relationships, and grow disciples. Everything that we do here is uh, an extension of doing that within this particular community. And uh, I want to start over these next couple of weeks to share with you the values uh, that we see as a congregation, the things that we feel as we come together as the people of God. Uh, and one of the things, one of our values is to be Christ-centered, that Jesus Christ is the very center of everything that we're doing. There's a lot of reasons for which you might gather a crowd of people together. They could come together around a speaker. They could come together around certain kind of music. Uh, people could come together because they enjoy a certain kind of event. Uh, but we come together because we, we know and love Jesus Christ, and we want him to be the very center of everything that we do. So um, one of our values, the core value, is that everything is Christ-centered. A second value that we have as a congregation is that is the value of family. And not just families, you know, extended families or families that have been here for many generations, even though we have a, a long history uh, in this community and we have families that, that go all the way back. Uh, we think of family as, a, as coming together as a family of God. And uh, we want to be a, a group of people that, that celebrates sort of the, the intergenerational connections that we have uh, together as God's people. And so we, uh, when we worship together, we do things for one another in worship. And we have different kinds of music that we blend together because we're a family that comes together. And we want to be able to celebrate the things that, uh, that are helpful to everyone. And one of the things that, because uh, we're making a transition here, one of the things we want to celebrate for one particular part of our, of our community of faith today is uh, to celebrate our graduates from high school and college. We've had a, a number of students that have completed that uh, part of their uh, education, and uh, this morning we're going to recognize them and celebrate uh, what God has been doing in their lives. So, Max, if you would introduce our graduates and, and uh, lead us through that part. All right. So they will be up on the screen here, and I'll invite them up in a minute as well. Uh, my name is Max, uh, I'm the director of Next Gen, which means high school students. When I got here uh, three and a half years ago, uh, these now seniors were freshmen. We've done it. We've come all the way through, and I love these kids. These, I shouldn't say kids. I love these students. I love these young adults. They're growing up. It's, it's incredible. Uh, so today we're going to celebrate those, those high schoolers, and we're going to celebrate also those who, who went through college. So if you are here, would you come up on the stage? We can, I'm not going to make you talk. Don't worry about like just in a line. Everyone can see your like pictures is cool, but to see you in person is awesome. We, uh, we have had a lot of students come through here. What's up, guys? I'm going to come down so you can see them. Everyone here up on stage right now has been involved in, in a number of different things. Youth groups, mission trips. We went to Haiti uh, the first summer I was here. We went to Loveland last summer. We're, we're looking forward to Nashville this summer. And we've had them in different capacities on different trips. And it's just been incredible to get to know these students. And so, you guys, you did it. Congratulations. I have a book for you. Uh, I'll give it to you after service. This book, I'll hold it up so you guys can see it. This book is called, I Guess I Haven't Learned That Yet. Uh, this, this author decided before COVID that her family was going to make the move from the Midwest to New York City. And then the pandemic hit. And so, she was just in for a whole bunch of changes. And what happened, uh, the title, I'll tell you where it came from, uh, her, her, her sons were in school, and that transition from the suburbs to the city, and they would come home from school frustrated, feeling like they're, they're failing, that, that they're no good, everything that they've learned has been uh, lost maybe in this transition. And they came up with this mantra, I guess I haven't learned that yet. 
You learned a lot of things in school. You think you know answers to things, uh, but life is, is still coming, right? You're, you're entering into a new season. And so I guess my encouragement is to remember this mantra and, and the stories from this book. I guess I haven't learned that yet. Be, uh, be okay with failing. Being okay with learning new things. And, and it's not failing, right? It's, it's saying, I guess I haven't learned that. And taking every opportunity as a chance to, to grow, to recognize strengths, discover who you are apart from family. But as your family here, we, we, we want to make a promise to you. We've done that in various ways, whether it's baptism, uh, either a, as a covenant when you were born or maybe a baptism later in life, or when you stand up for a, a, a profession of faith, we as your church family promise to be here, to support you, that just because you're, you're moving on to the next season doesn't mean uh, we're going away. So our doors are open. We love you. We pray for you. I would like to invite Pastor Kevin to come up and pray for our graduates. And if anyone would like to come up and lay a hand or, or stay where you are and extend a hand, you may do that as well. Can we have some people come up and lay on some hands? Let's, let's, get, let's get physical here a little bit. There we go. Here, come on up. Oh, yeah, well, let's do that while they're coming up. Yes, round of applause would be great. Let's get some hands up here. Now, if the rest of you want to extend a hand in this direction, that would be wonderful. Two hands. Let's pray. Lord God, uh, we give you thanks for the way in which, as a body of believers, we can celebrate um, the connections that we have together. I want to thank you for these students and for how you have worked in their lives. You have shaped them, you have molded them, you have taught them, and they have learned some things about, uh, from education and about life that enable them to take another step, some from high school, from community college, from uh, uh, four-year colleges. Lord, you're enabling them to move on in, uh, in life and and in responsibilities. I want to give you thanks for what you're doing in their lives. I give you thanks for, for parents who have come alongside of them, who have nurtured them, who have cared for them, who have trained them, and have modeled for them what it looks like to live the Christian life. I give you thanks for all those connections and for all those ways in which they're going to continue to, to carry out that task. Pray that you give to parents uh, the wisdom to shift to that next, uh, uh, that next relationship, that next way of living and walking as people, as these students make the shift from high school to college or to work or from, from college to, uh, to the job. And we pray that in each of those areas of responsibility that parents might be able to, to make those shifts that are necessary. And then we just thank you that as a body of believers, we can continue to lift them up in prayer. We pray that as they feel hands uh, laid upon their shoulders at this place in time, that they might know that, uh, that the prayers of this body continue to go with them, that as they go off to college this fall or step into a job, that they are a part of a community of faith that continues to lift them up and prays for them to be um, servants of yours in all the places where they go and all the things that they do. We thank you that we walk together as your people in each and every area of life, and we pray that we might honor and glorify you with who we are and all that we do. So, Lord, would you bless these students, give them what they are in need of. Um, we celebrate with them, and we just thank you for your blessing upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. You may head back to your seats. This time, while they're headed back to their spots, I want to invite you to take just a moment to greet those who have come uh, to worship around you this morning. There is coffee in the, uh, in the entryway if you'd like to grab a cup of coffee, and then in three and a half minutes, we'll uh, be listening to the Word of God. So, Oh, kids, uh, headed off to Central Park Kids. Now is the time if you would uh, make your way there. Thank you very much. Yes.
In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. I ran across a story about repentance uh, online last night as I was um, noodling through some things, uh, some, some headlines on the news. It was a, a story about a man who, had a, um, who discovered that every day when he'd go get his newspaper, that uh, the crossword puzzle in his newspaper was already finished. Someone had already done the, news, the crossword puzzle in his newspaper, and it didn't really bother him too much um, because he didn't do the, the crossword puzzles, but um, uh, to have someone be in his newspaper uh, doing that uh, kind of puzzled him as to who's doing the, the crossword puzzle in his newspaper. So, um, so he said he's going to find out who this is, and so one morning he goes out at 8 o'clock to get his paper, and his, his paper is already done. So the next morning, 7.30, I'm going to go out, and he gets the paper at 7.30. Yep, it's already done at that point in time. 7 o'clock the next morning, he goes up. Yep, it's already done. So another day, he puts a camera out by his mailbox. He wants to see who's doing it, and it is his neighbor. His neighbor is in his 80s. He's a widower, and uh, out, just as it's getting light outside, he goes out to uh, get the paper out of the mailbox, and uh, he puts the newspaper up on the mailbox and does a crossword puzzle in about 10 minutes, and he's constantly looking at the house to make sure no one's coming out, folds it back up, and puts it back in the, uh, back in the mailbox. Well, this guy decides he's going to do something nice for his neighbor, so he goes out and buys one of those books that has a thousand crossword puzzles in it, and he brings it to his neighbor's house, puts it outside the door, rings the doorbell, and then then just kind of goes away and watches from a distance. And uh, the neighbor comes out, sees the book uh, down on the the doorstep, picks it up, sits on his porch for the next two hours, and uh, does crossword puzzles until he falls asleep uh, in his chair sitting on the porch. Uh, The next afternoon, uh, when this guy comes home from work, um, the neighbor comes over with a plate of cookies and apologizes. He knows that he's been found out, and uh, he apologizes for opening up the neighbor's paper and reading the, or and uh, working the crossword puzzles in it, and uh, begins a relationship, a connection between them, and uh, they have many, many more conversations about, uh, about, about life and about crossword puzzles and those kinds of things. Um, this man, the older gentleman, had an opportunity to repent, um, and he did so in the midst of the grace that was given to him. But it raises the question for us, and it's a question that comes from the book of Jonah about our repentance, and how do do we repent in those times when we have been doing something wrong? When there's a time when we are in our conversation or our life with someone else, we discover that we are wrong about uh, how we treated someone or things that we said or what we did, and when we are confronted with the fact that we are wrong or that the thing that we did was hurtful, um, how do we respond? Do we quickly and humbly say, I'm so sorry, I was wrong? Or do we double down on the thing that we were doing and say, no, I was right and you're wrong? Or do we give one of those you know, fake apologies you know, where we say, I'm sorry that you felt that way about something that I may have said or done, you know, one of those politician kind of uh, apologies that we read from time to time. How do we repent with others when uh, we discover that we've done something wrong that's hurt them? Or how do we repent toward God? When God, by His Spirit, begins to lay something on our heart that's telling us, you know, this particular aspect of our life hasn't been quite right. Maybe there's a TV show or a movie that we've been watching that just has some content that we probably shouldn't be taking in, and the con- Spirit begins to convict us. Do we repent, or do we just say, no, I'm just going to go on and do what I want to do? Or, or perhaps there's something with our finances that, or how we're paying our taxes that we discover isn't quite right, and do we How do we repent? Do we repent? And when God begins to convict us that there's something in our lives, do we double down and continue to do what we're doing? Do we offer a humble apology, a humble repentance before God? This passage of Scripture, chapter 3 from the book of Jonah, is a story about repentance, about a people who repent uh, before God when they are presented with the fact that God is concerned about how they are living their lives. In fact, uh, God's message to them is that they are going to be overthrown, overturned because of what's been happening in their community, because of their violence. He sends a messenger to them. And we know that Jonah has really struggled 
with being able to go and tell them this message, but God has a message, and he's not giving up on Jonah being his messenger. So when we come to Jonah chapter 3, we discover that Jonah is finally uh, cornered by God, ready to be obedient to God because God is pushing him, and he's ready to go to Nineveh with God's message. Listen to what takes place. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and turn, and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. So the Ninevites repent humbly before God. In fact, if we look carefully at the story of the Ninevites here, we discover that this is a textbook case of repentance in Nineveh. Uh, everything that they do is uh, uh, des describes a perfect repentance from their particular point in time. Notice all the parts and pieces of how they repent. I'm assuming that as Jonah goes to talk to them, he's on his way to Nineveh, he's thinking about what has happened, and, and if Jonah is anything like me, I'm sure he's assuming that these pagans, these heathen that God has a mes message for, are not going to respond very well. He's probably imagining that as he goes into the city, he's going to begin to tell, to tell God's message and people are going to ridicule him. People are going to maybe throw tomatoes at him. Maybe they're going to try to push him out of the city. They're not going to want to hear what he has to say. Or maybe they'll listen to what he has to say, but no one or maybe only a few people will respond. He's probably feeling it's pointless to, to tell these people who don't know God that God is angry with them and God is going to overthrow their city. And so Jonah is probably very surprised when, when he begins to go into the city of Nineveh and begins to share the message of God that the word begins to spread ahead of him. That not only do the people hear what he has to say, but they begin to listen in such a way that they're, they're sharing it with their friends and neighbors, that it becomes a message that takes on a life of its own, and it begins to spread all the way through the city. And people begin to react to it with textbook kinds of repentance for their time and place. It says that they begin to fast. They put aside their food for the day and say, you know what, something is going on here that we need to take care of that's more important than us eating. And so they, they begin to fast. They take off their nice clothes and they put on their sackcloth, uh, their clothes of mourning, and they begin to mourn before God. And notice that it says, all of them for the greatest to the least. All of them from the greatest to the least did this. Now, so often in, in a society or in a culture, you've got this division between the, the rich and the poor, between the masters and the slaves, the powerful and the powerless, and, and everyone likes to blame everyone else for the troubles that are there. And many, many times it might be the ordinary folks who feel the burden of these things and say, yes, we need some change and transformation in our society, and I wish those people you know, that are in power would listen, or the people in power say, you know, we need to make some changes, and, and you people, you need to do these things. But in this particular case, it is everyone, from the greatest to the least, are convicted by the message that begins to be shared among them, and they begin to act. Notice that finally the word comes to the king. It's not a king-directed action. It's a, it's a word that finally comes to the king. The people are beginning to do this already. And notice the things that the king does. Very interesting progression. It says, the king of Nineveh rose from his throne. His throne is the place where the king is, or the ruler of the city is, when he's giving, you know, when he's showing his authority, that he's in power and in control. So for him to rise from his throne means that he is yielding the seat of authority to this God that is saying to them that their ways are not right. So as he takes off his royal clothes, his royal robes, a sign of his authority and of his wealth, sets those aside, instead puts on sackcloth. 
the clothing, the wrap, that's the same as everyone else in his city. He says, I am just as guilty as everyone else. We all look the same in this. And then he sits down in the dust. He sits in the dust. Notice uh, he gets off his throne, takes off his robe, puts on sackcloth, and sits in the dust. He's moved himself to being one among the people that needs to repent before God. And then he issues a decree. The decree goes out to all the people. And again, he's reinforcing the fasting. But notice he takes it, not just the people, but also the animals. And just think about that for a moment, for, for animals to be fasting. Of course, animals don't understand uh, what is going on. But what's going to happen in a few hours if the animals are not being given food or water? The cows are going to begin to bellow. The, uh, the sheep are going to begin to call out. All of those animals are going to begin to howl and make their noises. Um, I grew up on a farm, and I know the sound that all of the, all of the pigs would make when they were hungry, and we'd come into the building, and they knew that they were going to get fed. There was quite a din that they would make, and that's the kind of noise that would be rising up before God. It became a part of the call of his people into the presence of God. The king tells them, let everyone call urgently on God. Everyone earnestly, everyone from their heart, call upon God and ask for something to change. And then something very key. He shifts from doing those outward signs of repentance, the outward symbols of, of fasting and of sackcloth, of mourning and of being humble, and he actually tells them to give up their evil ways and their violence. He says, change your ways. Begin to do things differently. Live differently as people within this community. And then he shows a real humility before God. He says, who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Notice that he's being very humble before God. He's not saying, you know what, if, if we do these things, if we offer certain sacrifices or if we, um, if we repent in a certain way or if we stop doing these things, we know for sure that God will not overthrow us. He says, maybe, perhaps, maybe God is compassionate. Maybe God will relent from what it was that he was going to do. He is very humble before God, allows God to be in control. And so they've done their textbook case of repentance. They've done all of the things they possibly can. They've gone over the top in doing those things. And then notice what God sees. It says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he saw their acts of repentance, the sackcloth, the ashes, the, the, uh, the, the fasting, but then he also saw that they turned from their evil ways. He saw the change in what they were doing. I don't think even just the, the actions of, re, of repentance, going through the rituals of repentance, probably alone would not have been enough for God. But he saw that they turned from their evil ways, and then he relented. It did not bring disaster on them. God responds with compassion because they have come to him in repentance. They are humble before God. And it's a powerful story of, of God's grace, of God's mercy, and of, and of people willing to become humble before God, a God they didn't know. If you read the passage very carefully, you notice that when Jonah is talking with God, it's the Lord, it's Yahweh, it's God's name. But when the Ninevites are talking, it's just God, God in general. They don't know specifically who this God is. They don't know him as Yahweh. They just know that, that Jonah's God is angry with them. And they need to change their ways. They've begun to, perhaps they themselves feel that their society has grown evil and violent and something needs to change. And so they change the ways and they are spared. They receive God's grace. A wonderful story, a textbook case of repentance. But as we look at this story in the midst of the Old Testament, written to the people of God, presented to them, something curious appears. We discover that at the same time as Jonah is talking to the Ninevites and they are repenting and responding and receiving God's grace, the people of Israel are not repenting, are not responding, are not receiving the grace of God. In Israel, there is no repentance. We've seen it in, jo in Jonah himself that Jonah doesn't want to do God's will. He doesn't want to do what God wants him to do and said he runs away from God and God has to bring him back before he is obedient. We know at the same time as Jonah was speaking in Nineveh, there was a prophet in Israel by the name of Amos. This is two books earlier in the Old Testament. And we discover that as Amos is talking to the people of Israel in, uh, in uh, Jonah's home country, he says to them, this is what the Lord says, for three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. 
They sell the innocent for silver, the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground to deny, them, to deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar and garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God, they drink wine taken as fines. And so Amos is saying, people of Israel, here are some sins, and there's so many of them that God is not willing to relent but send you into judgment and to overthrow you, um, even though you are the people of God. But they don't respond. They don't listen. They have their, their rituals that they do, but they're meaningless and empty. Chapter 5 of Amos, God says, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. So the people of Israel are going through the motions of worshiping God, doing all the prescribed things that they need to do in the temple, but it's not affecting their hearts at all, and they're certainly not changing their actions. There is no justice. There is no righteousness among them. And so the worship that they're doing, the rituals that they're part of, God's not even paying attention to. It's not being helpful at all. We go a little further in the book of Amos, and we discover that the king is not leading them in following God either. There's um, another prophet that uh, is beholden to King Jeroboam, and uh, he speaks to Amos on the king's behalf. Amos has been saying that Jeroboam is going to die by the sword and that he's going to lose the kingdom. And uh, Amaziah, the prophet, says to, to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do not be prophesying here. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Notice that in those words that that false prophet speaks, he's saying that the king is more important than their sanctuary. The kingdom belongs to the king and the king is going to decide what needs to happen and the king is not willing to repent even though God has come to him again and again and said, things are not right in Israel. There's a lack of justice. You're oppressing the poor. There's idol worship that's going on. But then, even then, they will not respond to God. So why is it that the people of God who should know the grace and the mercy of God, should know the compassion of God, won't listen, won't respond, won't repent in a situation like that? And indeed, some 30 to 40 years later, it is the Assyrians who come from Nineveh and the surrounding area and conquer the people of Israel and take them away into captivity because they will not listen, they will not repent. And we wonder, why is it that the people who know the ways of God the best are the least likely to repent and to come to him? Jesus found the same thing to be true in his ministry. The leaders of the people, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, those who the, the priests, those who were the, the leaders of the people who knew the scriptures, who knew the prophecies, refused to recognize him as the Messiah. They didn't recognize him as the one who was coming. In fact, they said Jesus is a dangerous man. Uh, we, they tried to trip him up in the things he was saying. They insisted that they, he give them some kind of a sign that would prove that, that he was from God, but they never would accept the signs, the miracles that he did. In fact, they took it so far that they would put him to death. But the ordinary people in Jesus' day, the ordinary folk, the sinful folk, would listen to him. They loved to hear his words, and they experienced his grace and mercy. There's a tax collector by the name of Zacchaeus. They wanted to see Jesus. Jesus comes to where he is and invites him to come down to meet with him. And Jesus says, I'm coming to your house. He sits down to eat with him, and then this is what happens. It says, all the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I'll give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. So this tax collector experiences the good news in the person of Jesus, 
and he responds. He welcomes Jesus into his life, and there's a transformation that goes on there. Instead of being a, a cheat and a scoundrel, which every tax collector was, he says, I'm going to take half of my money, and I'm going to give it away, and the other half I'm going to use to repay all the people that I've cheated throughout my life. There's a transformation in his life because he's encountered Jesus. So someone that no one would have expected to repent, repents and receives salvation. But the very people that should have known the best to look for Jesus, to welcome the Messiah, are the ones who put him to death. Why is it that that continues to happen? That those who should experience most fully the grace of God are those who hold him at arm's length, but others receive and welcome the grace and forgiveness he gives. The wonderful thing in this passage is that it tells us that our God is a God who relents. In the prophet Isaiah, in the prophet Amos, he says again and again, uh, for these three sins and for four, I will not relent. I will not give up. But yet we see again and again throughout the Old Testament that when God brings judgment on his people and they turn and come back to him, he relents again and again. Because he is indeed a God of compassion. He's a God of grace, a God who wants people to be restored and he wants them to be whole. And so the good news for us for the people of Nineveh, for Zacchaeus, and for anyone who respond to God, is that he is a God who is compassionate and gracious. And though we need to be humble before him, we know that that is his nature. Peter, in his second letter, says that uh, God is, is, is patient. God doesn't want anyone to perish, but wants everyone to come to a knowledge of the truth. Our God is a God who relents. And so that brings us back to our repentance our invitation to repent. So we need to think about that. What gets in the way of our responding to invitations to repent? Sometimes it's simply that we've just gotten so used to, to living our lives in a certain way that we don't even think about anymore whether or not we're walking according to laws, God's laws and commands for us. That we don't even think about what is God considered to be right or wrong in our attitudes or our actions or how we're going about life. We're just doing life as we do life. And if there's a little something that, that seems like it might not quite be right according to this passage of Scripture or that uh, sort of standard for, for the people of God, we just kind of pass that off. So we're just not going to think about that thing. We've just gotten used to doing our own thing, and so we want to continue doing our own thing. Or perhaps we compare ourselves with others. We look at others around us and we say, you know what, I'm, I may not be perfect, but I'm better than, than those people are. I'm better than that pe person is. I'm, I'm better than those people in our culture that are doing those kinds of things. And so therefore, I'm, I'm pretty good. You know, I, I come to church, I, I read my Bible, I give, I'm, I'm doing sort of the Christian thing, so, so I'm, I'm doing all right compared to everyone else in the world. And so we don't repent. We don't come honestly before God with the things going on in our lives. Or maybe, maybe we just feel entitled to God's compassion, God's grace for us. We know that in Christ, God has opened up the way for sins to be forgiven. So we just count on our sins being forgiven. We just sort of assume that they're, they're all taken care of. Once in a while, maybe offer up a, you know, forgive me for my sins, God. But God wants us to come before him and just ask, is, what is there in my life that may need to change? I don't want to be like the, the people of Israel or like the leaders in Jesus' day um, who would hold him at arm's length because we think that we've got it all right. Instead, to be people who come humbly before God and say, God, what is it that you want to do in my life? That as we read scripture or as we worship together, that we would have hearts where we're listening to God and say, God, would you show us ways and places where we need to repent? Well, there might be something within us in, a, in an attitude or an action or a relationship with a person that we need to, to make right. And would you let us know what that is? And then we respond with humble obedience. Not necessarily putting a sackcloth and on, our, on our animals and sitting in ashes, but to, to change our way of life and to come humbly before God because our God is a God who relents. Our God is a God who, who opens up his heart to his people, and he wants us to walk with him in fullness and in holiness. But he invites us to come into his presence as people who, who ask, God, if there's something in me, something in my way of life that isn't right, would you show me what it is? And so as you walk through this week, seek to have that kind of an attitude in your relationship with God. 
in the conversations that you have with one another or in your reading of his word or in your prayer. Say, God, whatever it is that may need to change within me, would you point it out to me? Because I want to walk fully and completely as your person. I want to experience your grace completely and fully and be able to share it with the world that I'm a part of. Let's pray. Lord God, uh, we give you thanks that you are a God who relents, that you are um, one who, um, who is able, to, um, who is able to, to work and to walk with us in a way that, that uh, helps to make us holy. So thank you for your goodness and for your grace, for the way in which you love us and shape us and mold us. And we ask that we might come before you humbly as your people to see the ways in which you might call us to repent as we walk through everyday life because, and to experience the grace and the mercy of your compassion. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As a part of our response and worship this morning, uh, we are going to ordain Max as an elder. Um, a part of him becoming a commissioned pastor uh, in the Reformed Church in America uh, is that he needs to be first be an elder, uh, which is a task uh, with the church. And last year at our congregational meeting, we approved uh, him becoming a, an elder at large uh, for that particular purpose. And so, Max, I want to invite you to come up to the front here. I have some questions for you, uh, for you to answer. And then we shall continue on with the, uh, the order for, uh, for ordaining you. So, so Max, do you confess uh, together with us and with the church throughout the ages your faith in one God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Yes, truly, with all my heart. Do you believe the books of the Old and New Testaments to be the word of God and the perfect doctrine of salvation, rejecting all contrary beliefs? And do you believe in your heart that you are called by Christ's church and therefore by God to this office? Yes, truly, with all my heart. Will you be diligent in your study of Holy Scripture and in your use of the means of grace? Will you pray for God's people and lead them by your own example in faithful service and holy living? Will you accept the church's order and governance, submitting to ecclesiastical discipline should you become delinquent in either life or doctrine? Will you be loyal to the witness and work of the Reformed Church in America, using your abilities to further its Christian mission here and throughout the world? I will. As an elder, will you faithfully, diligently, and cheerfully study God's word, oversee the household of faith, encourage spiritual growth, maintain loving discipline, discipline and provide for the proclamation of the sacraments and the proclamation of the gospel and the sacrament let me try that one more time <laughs> provide for the proclamation of the gospel and the celebration of the sacraments i will and i ask for god to help me very good thank you max At this time max i invite you to kneel here if you would and i'd like to invite anyone who has been ordained as an elder or as a pastor before to to come up and join me in in laying hands on max for his ordination Two little pieces to the, uh, the ordination words. The first part is a prayer that ends with amen and then the declaration. So stay in your spots until both parts are done. Let us pray. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit, gentle as a dove, burning as fire upon Max Blummer, and fill him with grace and power for the ministry of elder. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only head of the church, I declare that Max Blummer is now ordained to the office of elder. Amen. All right, you may stand. Thank you. You may return to your seats. I have a question for the people of Central Park, if you would. Why don't you stand for this? People of Central Park, do you receive in the name of the Lord this elder as an ordained servant of Christ? Do you promise to respect him for the sake of the office for which he has been ordained?
Max, let me pray over you. Lord God, I want to give you thanks uh, for what you are doing in Max's life. I uh, thank you for the way in which you have enabled him over the past couple of years uh, to grow in knowledge and in experience uh, within this body of believers, enabling him uh, to come to this spot where today we're going to be commissioning him as a commissioned pastor in this church within Holland Classes. I thank you for the gifts that you've given him that enable him to to take on the role of elder uh, in this place, and I thank you for this body that has done that work in this day. I ask that as we work and walk together that we might honor and glorify you with all that we do and all that we are. And may your blessing be upon Max and his family. May experience your presence and your grace and your love to carry out the role that has been laid upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to stand as we sing. Uh, this is Amazing Grace. together who breaks the power who breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole
us I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. God. School, high school college graduates to make their way out first over to the uh, gathering place. We have cupcakes this morning, and uh, we want to be able to congratulate you, so find your way over there if you would, ahead of the crowd, please. Receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace today, tomorrow, and always. Amen. <laughs>